Hey there, everybody, and welcome. Today, I am going to be presenting a complete tutorial of Cooper Island, along with a two-player playthrough. So some of the some of the tutorial is going to be up front, but a lot of the tutorial will be over the course of the two-player playthrough as I demonstrate much of the functionality of the game. Now before I go any further, I should point out to those unfamiliar with my YouTube channel that uh, I demonstrate and teach games using programs that I developed for my own personal enjoyment, as you can see. This, this gives you a close-up view of what exactly is happening, and it saves me the trouble of having to use a zoom camera and flying around the table all over the place. It also ensures, if my program's working correctly, that I'm doing things correctly, I'm not missing anything, that the, the program is making sure that I'm following the rules of the game. That if you do notice something that doesn't seem quite kosher, obviously speak up in the comments and make note of that. So I programmed this without having actually received my copy of the game yet. Hopefully it's going to be coming next week. Uh, so I do apologize in advance that some of the graphics are a little more crude than I'd like. So, Cooper Island. You have discovered an uncharted island of peninsulas. Your goal is to develop your own peninsula by harvesting resources, um, un uh, uncovering its ruins, uh, erecting buildings and statues, boats, supplying cargo ships. Each peninsula consists of 19 land hexes surrounded by 18 water hexes that consist actually of nine individual sandbanks. It is important to note that the water is, is divvied up by sandbank, and I'll, I'll explain why that's critical in a little bit. You start the game with your peninsula with, with one landscape in your home hex, your home tile, which is going to go here. Now, the rule book says that uh, you, you start the game with a meadow and a food. Uh, but uh, it also goes on to say that once you're familiar with the game, you can have each player decide what uh, what they want to start with, and that's actually going to be the way I'm. That's the way I'm going to play today. I'm going to have each of the players, Blue uh, my, uh, Larry and Red Alex, decide what they want this initial hex to be. So uh, here are the four types of landscapes. We have meadow, which produces food. We have uh, forest, which produces wood, mountains, which produce stone or possibly gold, and settlements, which produce uh, produce cloth. And I'm going to have Larry right from the get-go choose uh, mountain. I think, yeah, I'll, I'll have uh, I'll choose mountain, and uh, I'll have Alex do something different. I'll have Alex choose forest. So neither one of us is actually choosing meadow, which is what, as I said, what the rules say you should do for your first couple games. Now it is important to realize, because I've started, now I've started here, we're looking at Alex's Peninsula right now, we started with a forest and there's a, there's a piece of wood sitting on top of it. Uh, it's important that, to understand that at the end of each of the five rounds of play, we are going to have to feed our workers. Now in round one, we each start with two workers and we're going to have to feed them two food. So, which is why the rule suggests you start with meadow and food so you're halfway to your goal of producing two food. I may intentionally make mistakes. I may accidentally make mistakes. You're not watching this video to see any great strategic play or watching this to see how to do well in the game. And on the contrary, I'm sure the, the scores are probably going to be pretty poor by the time I, I reach the end of the game. However, um, do understand that I am sort of doing things so I can demonstrate all the different uh, parts of the game and not necessarily doing things that uh, are especially smart. And frankly, when you're teaching and also managing two players, trying to be smart is not the easiest thing in the world. Uh, at, the, uh, at the start of each of the five rounds of play, there's an income phase. And at, it, during that income phase, uh, each player is going to be placing both an islet which consists of a landscape and, an, and a water tile, 
with a special uh, income bonus, as well as placing a double landscape tile, which uh, and the, each player starts with two double landscape tiles drawn from a bag of 60 tiles. So for example, uh, here you could see that Alex has drawn a meadow settlement tile, and on the back of that, is forest and, and mountain. All four uh, landscape types are always represented between the four hexes that make up a double-sided double landscape tile. And Alex also drew a meadow forest on one side with a, with a mountain settlement on the other side. So during the income phase, each player is going to be placing one of these islets and placing one of these double landscape tiles in any order they want to. Uh, and as the game proceeds, uh, if to the extent that a player has built any of these boats uh, over here, each player starts with it, the same set of six boats. Uh, if a player has, has built any of these and, and established them in any of these landing spots over here on the left side of the player board, they will produce income as well. Everything about this setup is pretty much the same for each player. Uh, we all start with the same six income boats. We all start with the same six islets. And uh, these are drawn from a bag, so these might be different. We all start with one coin in storage. I'll talk about storage momentarily. We all start with a cartographer track. So this is important as well. Uh, we uh, both, because we're playing a two-player game, both Larry and Alex start with uh, start on the uh, three spot of the cartographer track, which ranges in value between zero and six. You use the cartographer track to spend some of these cartographer points to take what are called anytime cartographer actions, and I will describe what those are over the course of the play. If you were playing a three-player or four-player game, the third uh, and fourth players in turn order would start on the fourth spot of the cartographer track. So that's the advantage they get uh, for being a little bit later in turn order at the start of the game. Otherwise, everything else is the same, the same six islets, the same six income boats, two uh, landscape tiles drawn from the bag at random, and we each start with one coin in our storage and one landscape, in my case, of our choice, with one resource matching it on top. We each have uh, a, uh, two ships, a small ship with one sail that is going to be sailing around clockwise around the board, and a large ship with two sails that's going to be sailing counterclockwise around the board from sandbank to sandbank. So in fact, when this ship moves, it's going to go here, and then it'll here, and then here, and then here, and then up there somewhere, which I'll explain. We're not actually traversing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight spaces here, but in fact we're traversing by sandbank. So one space, whether it be whether the ship is here or here, doesn't really matter. One space here, two space, uh, two spaces, three spaces four spaces, and so forth. I said we each start with one coin. We have a storage area that initially consists of five storage spots, one, two, three, four, five. We can get two other storage spots freed up if we build some small buildings later in the game. We can get an additional storage spot if we build this income boat that has a built-in storage spot on it. Uh, that would potentially be one more storage spots. And in fact, there are other ways to gain additional storage spots. Uh, but uh, all in all, we're never going to have more than maybe 10, 12 at most uh, over the course of the game. And it's more likely that uh, over the course of the game, each player is going to have at most seven or eight. If we fill all these spots with different resources, I can't store anything else. When you're paying for something, you can also pay with resources from landscape tiles. So this is kind of like storage as well. So I could pay right up front at the start of the game here if I had to, one wood and from this landscape tile and one coin from my storage. Each player also has a marketplace area at the bottom of their board 
where they can collect some resources and coins and so forth. There's no limit on what you can collect down here, but you can never pay for anything from your marketplace. Now you can use what are called market marketplace anytime actions to move goods and resources from your marketplace into your storage so that you have them available to you. But when you're making a payment, you can't pay part of it, move some resources in and pay some more. You cannot use this for payment. So at the start of each of the five rounds, there's an income phase where we each play an islet, we each place a double landscape tile, we might have income boats that we can get income from. And then after the income phase, there is an action phase during which we place workers. Actually, the rule book refers to it as a worker phase. This is the center uh, of the board, the main core of the island that, can, uh, that has this, uh, uh, consists of various action spots, which I'll talk more about when we get to the action or worker phase. After the action phase is complete, meaning after all players have used all, placed all of the workers they have available to them, then there's a cleanup phase. Uh, and uh, I'll talk about all the various steps of the cleanup phase when we get there. So let's get back to the income phase because what you do here, the placing of an eye with the placing of a landscape tile, this will give you a good feel of how the central mechanisms of the game work. Now, whenever you place an islet or a double landscape, or for that matter, a single landscape tile, you can place a single landscape tile as well. You always have to cap it with the, with the type of resource that that landscape produces. So if I placed another forest, it would come with a wood automatically. If I placed a meadow, it would come with a food. If I placed a settlement, it would come with a cloth. If, it, if I placed a mountain, it would come with a stone or possibly, as I said, a gold. The height, or what's also referred to as the cultivation level, identifies the value of the resource that's on the hex. So if this hex, in fact, were two forests high, one stacked on top of the other, then the wooden resource cube that's on top actually represents two wood because we're talking about a landscape that is two tiles high. If it were three tiles high, it would be three wood. When you're dealing with a mountain, when you place a mountain, it starts off with at one uh, level one producing stone. You could put another mountain on top of it, get it up to level two, at which point uh, the resource on top of it represents two stone. And then if you put another mountain on top of that, once you reach level three, you now have the option of either putting stone on top of the mountain or putting gold on top of the mountain. Settlements are wild. So when you place settlement tiles on top of, uh, you can place settlement tiles on top of other tiles that is fully permitted in the game. But if otherwise, if you're not placing a wild settlement, then you have to put a forest on top of a forest, a meadow on top of a meadow, or a mountain on top of a mountain. When you are placing an islet, you choose one of the six islets that you start with, and then you position it on your, uh, on your peninsula so that the land part of the islet is on, on a land hex, and the water part of the islet, in this case, the part of that's producing one coin for me, uh, is on a water space. So obviously this is not valid. This is not valid. I can rotate, this is not valid. You've got to have the land on top of land and the water on top of water. Furthermore, the land hex, in this case a meadow, uh, in my example here, has to be on an empty, uncharted hex. In other words, I can't, I wouldn't, if I had a forest hex uh, here, I wouldn't be able to place my islet so that the meadow was on top of forest. And frankly, even if I had a meadow tile there, I can't place the islet there either. The landscape of the islet has to be on an empty hex, uh, one that doesn't contain a landscape tile, and furthermore, one that's not occupied by a ruin. So this would not be valid either. The other important qualification is that when you're placing an islet, the landscape 
part of the half of the island has to be adjacent to some other hex in your territory. So I could not place this up here or any, anywhere up here. It would have to be um, down here so that this meadow is adjacent to the uh, forest tile. Potentially, I could place it over here. But the, but the rules actually say that for your first islet placement, you need to have it on the right side of your peninsula. Uh, therefore, your only two options are to place it this way, again, to ensure adjacency between that meadow and the forest to the left, or this way, rotated 60 degrees, so that the meadow is still in the same place, but the water half is now off to the east instead of off to the southeast. Those are your only two choices when you're first placing an island. But then as your territory grows this way or that way, uh, as long as you can have that landscape hex adjacent to one of your other landscape hexes, again, not, not where there's a ruin, um, you've got to clear that ruin first, then it's a perfectly legal placement whether you place it on this side or you place it on that side. And when you're placing a double-sided uh, landscape tile, one of these, you have a few more options. These can be placed obviously like this so that they ocup occupy two empty hexes, but again, at least one of the hexes you're placing has to be adjacent. So I can't place it up here, but I could place it here, I could place it here, or I could place it here. I could also place it this way. As long as one of your hexes is adjacent, it's a perfectly legal placement. Again, I couldn't place it here because I'd be taking up this space in the center occupied by a ruin. But otherwise, as long as I'm adjacent, um, I can place my double landscape tile on empty hexes. I could also place my landscape tile on top of other landscape tiles that match. So, for example, I could place this uh, so that the meadow half of this landscape tile went on top of another meadow, and the settlement half of this double landscape tile could go on anything, because remember, settlements are wild, so they can be placed on top of any landscape. The landscape, however, that you place the tile on top of has to be completely clear. It can't have a resource on it. It can't have any kind of a building or a structure on it. And that's why there are going to be times when you're going to be forced to remove resources from these hexes, get them into storage, so that you can build up your island the way you want to. It's also possible to place this so that one half of the landscape is on one level and the other half of the landscape is on a, a, a different level that's uh, off by one. So, for example, right now, if this wood weren't here, uh, let's see, I could rotate this around and put the settlement on top of the forest, and I could put the meadow on top of the blank hex. Now, right now, this is off by one because this is uh, the forest is at level one, and the empty hex is obviously level zero. There's nothing there. So in order to accomplish that, I would have to perform one of my cartographer anytime actions that I referred to earlier in the game. Now, there are four different ways you can use a cartographer anytime action. The simplest way, and the one that you're more often to use than not, I would say, is to spend one cartographer point, and you're basically going to insert a single landscape on the lower half of that, so that you're basically creating a, what the rubble calls is a shim. You're, you're shimming up this part of the, the, this part of the hex to get to level one. So now both hexes are at level one and now I can place that double landscape tile on top of them as long as the terrains match or it's settlement, which is wild. It is round one, the income phase. It's Alex's turn because she was, she drew the short straw and so therefore she is going to be the starting player, and what am I going to have her do? I am going to have her pick this islet. This one allows you to gain a food along with a wood or a stone of your choice. Now, when you're gaining resources, you always have the option of declining them. You don't have to take them if you don't want to. Um, 
because you might want to save your storage spots for other resources uh, or you might not have any free storage spots or whatever the case may be. I'm going to take this eyelet. Now remember I said that the first eyelet either has to be placed this way or placed this way. Uh, it really doesn't matter. Um, and frankly, remember I said that ships move from eyelet to eyelet. If, if you had a ship occupying this space and you wanted to place the eyelet like that for any reason, that's perfectly okay. You just then move the ship over to the other half of the eyelet. But that's the other key rule about placing eyelets. You can never position an eyelet so that the two water spaces of a sandbank are occupied by eyelets. Uh, I can place one here, but I then could not place another one up here on another, in another round because then I'm filling up both of these spaces with eyelets. Not allowed. You have to allow one half of each sandbank free so that there's a place for the ship to move around the island. Okay, so I'm going to place this eyelet here, and I immediately get to resolve the, the income of the eyelet. So I will position it. Remember, I put a stone on top of the mountain. That's done. My program does that automatically. And now I'm being asked, do, uh, do I want to gain a food? I will say yes. That goes into my storage. Pink, food. And now I get to choose whether I want a wood or a stone. And what do I want Alex to choose? Uh, she's going to take, we'll take a wood. So now I've got a coin, I've got food, and I've got wood in Alex's storage. As well as uh, a stone on this hex and a wood over here on this forest hex. Now the other half of my income phase, remember, is I can place one of these double landscape tiles. So, let's do something fancy right from the beginning. Let's move this stone from this forest, uh, from this mountain rather, into storage. Remember, I only have two storage spots left. So, I'm, this is going to get tight, but I'm going to move this stone into storage. I'm going to move this wood into storage. And now that these are empty and there's nothing on top of these hexes, I can freely put another hex on top of it. So when I'm placing, say, this hex, the back of this tile, if you will, that has a forest and mountain on it, I can place it right on top of the existing one so that the forest goes on top of the forest and the mountain goes on top of the mountain. And now I've got tiles that are two tiles high my program places a two in the box to tell me that it's level two and this uh, wood cube is worth two wood. And similarly over here, I've got a stone cube worth two stone because this mountain is now two levels high. This forest is now two levels high. So I placed an islet. I placed a double landscape tile. Alex's income phase is over. Now, usually the income phases are done simultaneously. Obviously, I'm not doing them simultaneously with my program. So I'm going to end Alex's turn, move over to Larry, and now Larry will decide uh, what he wants to place. Let's, let's again do something a little different. Let's place our double landscape tile first. Because again, the order doesn't matter. You can place things in whatever order you want. I'll get this stone off, this mountain, and maybe I'll take this tile and place it like that. Now, remember, the mountain's going on a level one mountain space, and the forest is going on, a, on an empty hex. So that's a case where they're off by one level, and in order to do this, I need to insert a single landscape shim. I have to perform an anytime cartographer action, meaning I'm going to spend one of my cartographer points. I'm going to drop from a value three to the second step of the track. That's going to allow me to take a single forest hex, insert it into this space so that both spaces are then level one and that, and then I can, it will allow me to place this so that I end up with a level two forest and a level two mountain. So I'm similar, I'm accomplishing something similar to what Alex did, except I am now doing it via a cartographer action, whereby I have to spend one cartographer point to create that single landscape shim in order to make this work. 
Okay, so I will place this like that. My program says, do you want to use your cartographer? Any time action to insert a shim? I'm going to say yes. So a single forest tile gets placed here automatically, and now I have a, a level 2 forest with 2 wood and a level 2 mountain with 2 stone. Like something very similar to what Alex had, but I did it with a cartographer action. Now I should say while I'm talking about these anytime cartographer actions, you are limited to doing them once per turn. Um, and that means once during the income phase, at the, at the start of uh, each round, once during each of your turns, meaning during each of your worker placements, um, during the action phase and since we each start with two workers that means that's another that's a second and a third possible uh, cartographer action and then you can do one at cleanup in the last phase of the round uh, again limited to one cartographer action so at most you're going to be performing four of these but in order to accomplish it you also have to have the points on your track that you can spend um, and you, you'll find out that Inserting a shim, while it only costs one cartographer point, all the other cartographer actions cost more. The next one will cost two. There's one that costs three cartographer steps, and the other, uh, the last one costs four cartographer steps. I'll get I'll get into that a little bit later on. I've now uh, placed my double landscape tile, and now I'm going to uh, place my islet. Remember, it has to go over here. Uh, either this way or this way, and I'm going to place this one. This one allows me to remove a ruin um, from the uh, from my island, from my peninsula. Uh, one of the five ruins. Now the rule is that when you're removing a ruin, you can only remove a ruin that's adjacent to one of your existing landscapes. So now you know why I place this tile first. If I place the remove ruin islet first. I wouldn't have been able to remove an isle, uh, remove a ruin because none of my ru ruins would have been adjacent to my single mountain hex, which was down here at the start. So by building up and building toward this center ruin, now that I'm adjacent to it, I can place this and get the full benefit of this island. So I'll place it here, and the uh, the ruin is taken from this spot it's the only ruin i could have taken so my program automatically s removes it from my peninsula flips it over and on the reverse side of the ruin is a statue because statues are going to be built during this game and the statue is placed in one of my statue crafting spaces now i have i start on my player board with three spaces two of which are blocked off by these large buildings. So really, at the start of the game, I only have one statue crafting spot avail available to me, meaning I would now have to build this statue before I can possibly remove another ruin, unless I first built a large building and freed up another spot on my player board. For now, Larry has completed his income phase as well, and that's going to take us in now to the action phase. Now remember I said we each start with two workers. We actually each start with two normal round workers. And uh, we have the potential of adding additional round normal workers or square special workers, which give us added bonuses. Before we start placing workers, let's very quickly go over what all the various action spots are and what they do. Round normal workers can only be placed on the round action spots so that's pretty obvious and the square workers if you have one can only be placed on the square spots once you place a round worker in a circle in a, a round spot or a square worker in a square spot you can't put another round or another square worker in that same spot later in the same round in other words you, you are limited to having one of your workers in each spot max you can never have two workers in the same action spot but i could potentially put one round worker here and one square worker here because these are although they're the same action there's they're con considered different action spots this is the normal action spot this is the uh, special action spot 
what do these action spots do? And you see I have labels here to um, make it clear. Uh, obviously, there's iconology here, which uh, will help you when you're playing the game, understand what each of these various spots does. But because this is a little blurry and not so easily um, uh, interpreted, I put these text labels on to make it clear so you know what each one does. So, this is action spot A, made up of a normal action and a spot and a uh, special worker spot. If you are the first player to place a normal worker here, then you'll be covering up, covering up this Cooper, Cooper the dog. The game Cooper Island is named after the uh, designer's dog named Cooper, uh, who is, is alive and well. In fact, there's a little blurb at the back of the rule book that talks about where the uh, designer talks about Cooper. So if you're the first player to place a normal worker here, you will be the new start player for the next round. If you're uh, otherwise, the action you take in this spot is to is to either draw a double landscape tile. Now notice that Alice is down to one because she started with two and placed one of them already. <clears throat> so here, if she went here, she could either draw a double landscape tile or place a double landscape tile, her choice. And she also gets to advance one step up on the cartographer track. If you place a, a special worker here and you're the first player to do so, then you cover up this plus spot and therefore you get to both draw and place a, uh, a double landscape tile in either order and also advance one spot on your cartographer track. Remember, it's only the first player to either place a token in a spot that's a round spot that's annotated, and frankly, this is the only one that's annotated, uh, or the first player to place a special worker in the square spot to get that special benefit. Anybody else who comes there after is not going to get that benefit. Okay, action spot B, if you're, uh, you can place a, a, a normal worker here in order to build an income boat. You can place, if you're the first player to place a special worker here, you can build an income boat, but at a discount of two meaning you can knock off a coin or two coins or a coin and a resource or two resources, whatever, whatever it is you want to discount the price by. But again, you've got to have, you've got to be the first player to place a special worker here. Action spot C lets you both draw and place a, a double landscape tile. But frankly, since you're not limited to the number of double landscape tiles you can have in your reserve, you might as well draw first because it might expand your options. And then you would follow that with a placement. If you are the first player to place a special worker here, then uh, you also get to perform the action of any islet tile on any player board. So Alex placed the food, uh, wood, or stone islet, and Larry, if you recall, placed the remove a ruin Pilot. So as long as it's been placed by any player, you would be able to use that action spot to get that benefit. So putting a special worker here lets you do this action, this action, and also one of any one of the islet actions that have already been built up on the on a peninsula. This normal worker spot lets you build a building, whether it be a small building a large building, which are one of these. You start with two small buildings occupying two storage spots. You tar start with two large buildings occupying uh, statue crafting spots. Or you could build a fortress, which is uh, hiding this other action that you could possibly take, which I'll talk, talk about later in the game. But uh, you have two small buildings. You have two large buildings, which obviously cost more to build. The prices are here, but we'll talk more about that when the time comes. And you could build the fortress. You don't have to build these in any order, but chances are you're going to be starting small. So you're going to be starting with a small building. And as you build up your resources, you'll be able to progress possibly to a large building and then to a, forest, a fortress later in the game. If you were the first player to place a special worker here, 
you can build any one of these buildings and you get a, a two resource discount just like you did up here. This, uh, this is spot E now. Uh, if you place a normal worker here, you can advance your cartography track by three steps up to a maximum of six obviously and you could take a coin or a resource of your choice and put it into your storage area. If you are the first player to place a special worker here, you do that and also you get to perform um, the, the action of any income boat that someone has built on their player board. Uh, remember I said you could, uh, one of the actions is to take one of these boats and build them on one of these uh, landing spaces. So once a player has done that, or once multiple players have done that, this special action here allows you to go around the board and pick any one action you want and do that particular action as long as that boat's been built. Action F, placing a normal worker here, allows you to either build a statue or remove a ruin. Placing, if you're the first player to place a special worker here, the plus sign lets you do both in any order. Action spot G, here you're either drawing two double landscape tiles or placing two double landscape tiles, your choice, one or the other. If you were the first player to place a special worker here, in addition to either drawing or placing two double landscape tiles, but not a combination, it's either draw two or place two, you can also advance one step on the cartographer track. And then finally, uh, action H allows you to supply a cargo ship. But if you're the first special work, uh, the first player to place a special worker here, then you get to draw or place a double landscape tile. Uh, Alex has been busy building up resources and she now has what she needs to build a small building. She's got two wood here and two wood in her storage for a total of four wood. She's got a stone here and two stone here. That's a total of three stone. And she has one coin. That's, gonna, that's enough for her to build a small building. Costs one coin, two wood, and two stone. She doesn't have the extra coin uh, or the extra stone she would need if she wanted to build a large building. So when I come here and place her first normal worker, it's going to automatically assume we're going to be erecting a small building. Okay, and here we are, and uh, the, my program is now prompting Alex as to how she wants to pay for uh, the resources. And remember, this has to be done in one shot from whatever she has in storage and or whatever she has on her landscape tiles. So she does have options. Now the coin she has to pay from here, so that clearly is coming out of her storage. The stone could be partially paid here but can't be partially paid here this is only one resource cube so you either pay the, you pay this one worth two or you pay this one worth one and since we owe two stone we're not going to pay this one and then this one because now we're wasting an extra resource when we didn't have to so we're clearly going to pay the cost of the stone right from this tile here but a number still there to indicate that it's level two because we're We've got this top-down view. You can't make out what otherwise what the level of this uh, hex is. We could pay the two wood from this hex or the two wood out of our storage because storage spaces are limited and, and relatively tight at this stage of the game. I'm going to be paying the wood right from my storage. So I'll pay that wood and that wood. And now I've completed the building, and now I get to spend the one helm point I gain for building a small building. A small building allows you to get one helm point, but it actually, if you build the small building on a settlement, you get an extra bonus helm point. Victory points in this game are called helm points. If you build a large building, you get two helm points, but you get a bonus if you build it on a settlement. If you build a fortress, you get four, uh, four helm points and a bonus point if you build it on a settlement. Now, what are the rules of building? Well, the building that you're erecting has to go on one of the highest landscape tiles because now you're putting a building on it and that's it. That building's not going anywhere and no longer are you going to be able to use that high landscape for 
resources. Now, it has to also go on a, a landscape that is devoid of anything else. You can't put it where there's another building. You can't put it where there's any resource cube sitting on top of it. So this couldn't go here. Now, this was a level two forest. This was a level two mountain. The only place this small building could have gone was here because it's, you can't put it. And I could have used an anytime action to remove the wood first, but I chose not to. I decided to leave the wood there and therefore um, just build the small building on this spot. Okay, so that, because this is a small building, I now get to score well one helm point. Now when you score a helm point in this game, you always move your ship, most of the time I should say, uh, one, one space, if you will, around the island. Now I can either move my small ship and go this way, or I can move my large ship and go this way, and any time a ship goes over a, a dub, uh, an islet tile, you get to get the benefit of that islet tile. So by moving my large ship from here to here, I'm passing over this islet, and now I get to resolve it again. Maybe uh, at this moment I should stop for, for a moment to give you the big picture because we're not seeing how this board is actually laid out. Let me switch over to this Word document I prepared earlier so that you can see that when you're playing a two-player game as we are now, you have the two islets sitting like this and there are bay tiles that separate them. There's a bay tile that's right here on the central island board and another bay tile that's here. So as I move my large ship, and if, let's say I'm blue and I'm over here, as I move my large ship, it's going to move the five spaces here. And when it gets the, to the fifth space, it's going to go one, two, three, four, one space per land sandbank. And then the fifth space is going to take it to the bay tile where something's going to happen. But then if I continue the movement of my ship because I scored enough points, it's going to continue around the other side of my opponent's a peninsula so it's going to come around here and if I just if I score enough points it's going to hit her harbor where something's going to happen and then it'll start moving this way so as I move over either my islets or move over her islets I'm going to be resolving those islets as my ship passes over those different different places in a three-player game, this is the layout where you've got three peninsulas surrounding the central core board with bay tiles separating each player. So if this were me down here, my small ship would go this way to the bay tile, then to the right side of my to the player to my left's peninsula around to his or her harbor, up around the left side of his or her peninsula to this bay tile, and then back to my the right side of my opponent and around this way and potentially I suppose I can even score enough points to bring it back around toward my peninsula. Not likely in this, certainly not in this sample game, but it's possible if you're doing well. And then finally you put the board when you're playing a four player game together this way. Again, each player is separated with, has this bay tile between their peninsulas so that when you move five spaces, the fifth act, the fifth space gets your ship to a bay tile, and then if you keep moving it, you're going to get onto the peninsula of either the player to your left or the player to your right. So you can see that your ship is actually going to be moving and circumventing this board um, once you score a sufficient number of points. So anyway, I'm back here. I built a small building. I now get to move one of my ships. Obviously, I'm going to move my large ship so I can take advantage of this tile. I do have the storage space for it, so I'm going to select my large ship. It's going to move one space from here to this other half of the sandbank, and because I'm passing over this tile, I resolve it. I can gain one food if I want. I am going to, to do that. And then I can gain either a wood or a stone. And, uh, well, since I covered up my mountain with this small building, I think for now I'll take a stone. Okay, and that goes right into my storage. If you build a small building or a large building, either one of those, then the last thing you do 
after building is to choose, is to draw four building cards, small building cards. Well, actually, in this case, yeah, small building cards, uh, because I built a small building, and choose one of them to keep and discard the other three to the bottom of the deck. You can only start using the ability of that card in your next turn, uh, possibly in the next turn of the same round, and then for the remainder of the game. Now, when you erect a small building, you draw from the small building deck, and small building cards give you an ongoing ability. If you erected a large building, you're going to draw four cards from the large building card deck, and large buildings give you big one-time abilities that you can get one time during the game, but possibly multiple times during the game if you can reactivate or untap that card. We'll talk more about that when the time comes. But for now, what do we want to do? These are the four cards that Alex has drawn. We drew the Harbor Master's Office. Uh, supply cost for a cargo ship is reduced. Um, I haven't even thought about whether I'm going to be building, car supplying cargo ships. Maybe I will. Maybe I'll have Alex supply cargo ship. Maybe I won't. That's one of the actions of the game. Uh, so I don't know that this card particularly has any interest. The warehouse counts as an extra crate space. To place a crate lid here, pay a coin or a resource cube. Crates are also produced when you supply a cargo ship, crate lids. So these two cards are similar because they both have to do with cargo ships. The pawnbroker, whenever you supply a cargo ship, gain a coin. These three cards all have to do with cargo ship. Just luck of the draw, folks. And then the granary, the total feeding cost for your workers is reduced by one food. Now that is of interest um, because I don't have a choice. I'm going to have to feed my workers and right now pay two food at the end of this round. It would be nice if I had the granary and would then only have to pay one food. And then I'd have a food left over for next round. So I'm going to take the granary. And that is now part of my, my tableau. And finally, we can move on to Larry's first worker placement. What am I going to have Larry do? Well, Larry removed this ruin, so he's primed to build a statue, which is sitting here on this statue crafting spot. So let's put our normal worker here so we could either remove a ruin or build a statue. Obviously, we can't remove a ruin right now. We have no place to put it, nor do we have any landscape tiles adjacent to any other ruin. So that's not an option, but we're going to use the half of the action that allows us to build a statue. To build a statue, you either have to pay three wood or three stone. I've got three wood. I've got three stone. Alternatively, you can pay two wood or two gold. I have no gold. That's not an option for me. So build one statue. I am going to be paying the two wood here and the other wood from here. That's my three wood payment and two stone here and my other stone from here. And once I pay, make, complete this payment, I am going to have a choice as to where I place the statue. Same rule applies. It has to go on one of the highest landscape spaces you have on your board and notice I've got a forest that's level two and a mountain that's level two. Neither one has a resource cube on top of it so I, I'll have my choice of where I want to build that statue. I get a point for building the statue. I'll also get a point for the statue at the end of the round. I'm going to find out about in, uh, end of round scoring a little bit later on. Um, and also if I build the statue on a settlement I get a bonus point. I don't have any settlements, so that's not an option right now. Anyway, let me pay, pay my last stone here. Now I have to choose, do I want to put my statue here, or do I want to put my statue here? Uh, where do I want to put it? Do I care? I really have no resources right now to speak of, so it really doesn't matter. I'll just stick it here. Okay, so now this, this hex is locked up. It can never produce resources. I can't put anything else here. It is permanently going to be a level two mountain with a statue on top. That's the end of that. I get one helm point for building the statue. Uh, now, do I want to move my large ship? Well, if I do, I'll get the benefit of this islet that says remove one ruin. But I can't. I don't have any, I don't have any ruins that are adjacent to my landscapes. 
So I'm going to move my small ship. Why waste that when I could possibly do it later? So I'm going to choose the small ship and move that one sandbank over clockwise around my island. And that ends my turn. Now we go back to Alex's turn for her other worker. Let's, let's create a situation where both players want to use the same action spot. So I'm going to have Alex come here uh, where I can advance three steps on the cartographer track and take a, a resource or, or a coin of my choice. I will advance three steps on the cartographer track. So now I'm maxed out at six. I went from three to six. I didn't waste any of those steps. I will now do this part of the action and I'll choose to gain. Uh, what do I have? She's got two food. I'll take a coin. It's still Alex's turn. Maybe I'll have her perform a cartographer anytime action. So the first one I showed you was where you create a shim in order to put a double landscape tile on a, on a, on a part of your board where the levels of the two sides are off by one. Uh, this time I'm going to put a landscape tile on, a, on an empty hex. And the cost of doing that, that cartographer anytime action, is two steps. I am going to uh, click over here to say I want to perform a cartographer anytime action. I am going to put a put a, a hex a landscape here on this hex that's northeast of my um, of my small building. And do I want to put a meadow, a forest? A mountain or a settlement it doesn't matter it's still costing me two cartographer points I will put a mountain and again every time you put a landscape down you put a resource on top of it so I build a mountain it's level one and a resource a stone resource goes on top of it and now I've dropped down from six to four on my cartographer track that's the end of Alex's turn let's go over to Larry what is he going to do now? He, because I said I want to show you an example of what happens when a player goes to the same action spot. So I'm going to have Larry place his normal worker, same place where Alex went. He has to pay a fee to Alex. He has to either pay her a coin or one resource of his choice. Um, now, in a, if it was a three-player game or a four-player game, if you're the third player to go, you have to pay the person who most recently placed there. If there was a third player, say, named John, uh, he would not have to pay both Larry and Alex. In this case, Alex placed first, Larry placed second and paid something to Alex, then John would place third and pay something to Larry. The payment goes into the recipient's marketplace. Larry has the option, in this case, I have the option of not paying if I didn't want to, or maybe I couldn't pay. Uh, I could still go there and not make the payment, but in that case, I'm going to have to take a penalty called an anchor token. I am going to make the payment right now because I can afford it. I'm going to pay her the, co the only coin I have. Um, that's really all I've got to my name, so I'm going to pay her the coin, but uh, don't worry, I'll create a situation where we where some player gets anchor tokens later on in the game. Well, Larry's going to pay Alex a coin. Okay? And if we look at Alex's player board, you'll see now that that coin is sitting in her marketplace. It's not actually taking up a space in her storage. Alex can decide then and there, because she has a free storage spot, she can decide to put the coin there or maybe leave it here for now. I'm not going to make that decision for Alex. I'm too busy worrying about Larry's turn. Uh, so I'm just going to advance three steps on the cartographer track. That gets me up to five. And um, then I'm going to take a coin or a resource. I will take uh, a stone. And then I, I'll do the same thing that Alex did. I will spend two of my cartographer points to put a mountain here. It's getting me adjacent to this ruin, so since Larry is building statues, he needs to remove ruins and therefore needs to have his landscape adjacent to one, so this is a good reason for me to do it. So I'll put it there, I'll make it a mountain, and a mountain gets placed there with a stone on top, and I've spent two of my five cartographer points, so now I'm down to three points. 
That ends both actions. Nobody has any workers left, so I'm going to end the turn and move right into the cleanup phase. Now, before I go there, let's talk about the, the seven steps you go through during the cleanup phase. Before you start the cleanup phase, each player can decide if they want to move any of their resources from their marketplace. You've got to move it or else you're going to lose it, as you'll soon find out. Uh, Alex is the only one that has anything in her marketplace. What are we going to do? Are we going to have her keep this? Yeah, we might as well for now. Um, it could be a little risky. Limits what her options are. But we're going to be freeing up some space because we're going to be paying some food so uh, to feed workers. So I'll stick that up in there. If I didn't do that, my program would have reminded me to, to, to do it before I started the cleanup phase. But the first step of the cleanup phase is that everybody's got to feed their workers. For every food they don't, they cannot pay, they have to take an anchor token. Um, ha. Ah, okay. Larry hasn't generated any food. He's gonna, he has to pay two food. We're gonna see anchor tokens right away. So, uh, in, in uh, kind of half inadvertently, I've uh, created a situation where uh, we're gonna you're gonna see how anchor tokens work very shortly. Um, the second step is that uh, each player is able to reactiv reactivate a building card that they flipped over because they used that card. That would have been a large building card. Nobody's built a large building yet. Or a crate lid bonus. Um, we haven't seen any crate lids. Crate lids come from cargo ship actions. You'll see some of those hopefully later in this sample game. So right now that step is meaningless to us. The third step is that each player scores for any statues they built. So while you do get a point for the statue when you build it, you're also going to get a point for every statue that you have built at the end of every round. So statues can be very, very valuable in that regard. Uh, you also score a point if you uh, filled your passage. Your passage is these three hexes at the top of your peninsula. You're only going to be getting that helm point possibly in round five, maybe in round four if you're really good, but it's highly doubtful. Um, that's, a, that's a bonus you're only going to possibly get. Uh, later in the game, and it's highly unlikely in this sample two-player playthrough, either one of us is going to get up there. The next step is that everybody gets their workers back. They take them off the action board and return them to their uh, personal reserve. The next to the last step is that if, if there are any other resources remaining in your storage area, in your marketplace, you've got to clear them out and return them to the supply. So as I said, the, the marketplace is only temporary. If you, don't, if you don't move them into your storage space by this step, then whatever's there is going to get cleared out and returned to the supply. And then finally, the last step is that the harbor master, who happens to be currently standing upright on the first of five cargo ships up here on the side of the board, uh, He's, here's the harbor master. He's going to move in advance to the second cargo ship. So that, uh, on the one hand, is a way to track what round it is, but there also is a, another role that the harbor master plays, which we'll see when somebody decides to build a supply a cargo ship. So now let's actually do the cleanup. Alex has to pay one food because she has the granary. Uh, normally she'd have to pay two. Um, so we, her one food's going to come here, and then Larry has to pay two food, but he's got zero food, so he's got to take two anchor tokens. They go under your ships, basically, and they keep your ship from moving. So when you score points, you're not going to be able to move that ship that has anchor tokens under it. You have to first remove the anchor tokens. Now, when you've got an even amount of anchor tokens under both ships, doesn't matter which ship you put the anchor token under, but if you don't, the game does not allow you to put all the anchor tokens on one ship and let the other one free for sailing. You've got to spread them out evenly. Because I'm getting two anchor tokens because I didn't pay my two food, one of them is going to go on a small ship, the other one's going to go on my large ship. Now I said they go under your ships, they physically sit under your ships, but for my program purposes, I just put them here on the side and display them that way. 
So now we're at the step where we score for statues, and Larry has built a statue, so he gets a, a helm point. But he can't move either of the ships because there's anchor tokens on them. You always have the option of using your helm points to get anchor tokens off your ships in whatever order you want. So I'm just going to clear this one, and that'll be the how I'm spending that anchor point, uh, that that um, helm point. Anchor tokens are worth minus, minus one helm point at the end of the game, so. Basically, you're scoring the point by getting rid of this negative point. Okay, that was my one point for my statue. Now we're in round two. The harbor master has moved over and now is standing up on the second cargo ship. And it's back to Alex's income phase in round two. What am I going to have Alex do? Let's have her take this one, which produces one coin. And now we can put it over on this side if we want. So I'm going to rotate it and put it right there. Now I could put it like that. It doesn't really matter, but I might as well position it this way so that when my when I do move my small ship, and it, it'll be able to pass over immediately, and I'll be able to get a coin when the ship passes over that islet. So uh, let's put that just like that. I produced another food, so now Alex has two food, and she gets to resolve this islet immediately. She gets to gain a coin. She's got the space for it, so she is going to take the coin. Okay, uh, then the other half is that she gets to place a, a double landscape tile in addition to that islet. Okay, let's take this one, rotate it like that. And I'll place it just here to the left. So, so I'm occupying these two spa empty spaces. And this will result in a level one mountain with one stone and a level one settlement with one cloth. Okay. That ends Alex's income phase. Move on to Larry. Well, let's show off another land, another island. Here's one that allows you to draw a double landscape tile. Larry's got one to his name. It might be nice to have another one. So let's take this one. And uh, we're going to also put it on the other side. Might as well. So I'll rotate it. And uh, I'll position it just like this. Remember, it could go here. I could have put it up here if I wanted to because it's still... The mountain's in an empty space that's adjacent to one of my other hexes, my other landscape, so that's perfectly valid. But I might as well put it here so that it's in position for my small ship to pass over it sooner rather than later. And a stone goes on top of the mountain. It did draw another tile, so now I've got two tiles in my personal reserve to choose from. Let's get rid of this resource off of this hex, put it into storage, so that stone goes over here. And I'm going to now, remember this is too high, this forest is too high, this mountain's one high. I'm going to put the double landscape this way. I'm going to need to do a, an anytime cartographer action to create a shim to get the this mountain hex over here raise it up to level two so it's even with the forest and then i'll be able to place this on top of it and make it level three so yes i want to perform a, a cartographer anytime action to insert a shim it's going to cost me one of my cartographer points i'll drop from three to two and now i'm getting this i've got the forest up to three i'm getting the mountain to level three and now i have the choice of putting stone or gold on the mountain sure why not i'll take gold so now i've got three gold on this level three mountain and three wood on this level three forest so that starts the uh action phase again first player doesn't change unless somebody goes to the cooper spot and decides to take the start player token but larry has not chosen to do that yet at least uh so it's alex's turn have i worked this out so she's got enough to build another building yes she does so let's go back here and place our normal worker into this tried and true spot and she is now going to erect another small building 
Again, doesn't have enough for that large building. Uh, we are short. What do you need for a large building? You need four wood, four stone. We only have two wood and four stone, so that's not an option. Uh, the we'll pay the coin from storage. Uh, we'll pay the two wood from here, from this forest. We'll pay the two stone. Uh, we could either use this stone or we could use this stone. We might as well free up the storage spaces. So I'll use both stone for my storage. And then remember, the small building has to get placed on one of the available highest landscape tiles that's free. Uh, there's only one free at this stage, this forest. So that's where the small building is going to go. There's no choice about that. Um, what do I have to do? Pay the last stone, right? Pay both stones. So there goes the small building. And you heard a ting because I've achieved one of my milestones. You, get a, you reach a milestone. You flip one of these tiles on your player board if... You have uh, built two statues on your board, or you have built two income boats, or you have supplied two cargo ships, or you have built two buildings of any type. So Alex has done that. She's flipped this tile, and now it's ready to, ready to be placed over here to get the milestone bonus of either an extra normal worker or a special worker three possible places to put a tile if you want you could also put it down here and just collect two helm points first first things first let's spend this helm point that we got for building a small building and we have to have to want we'll to deal with the building card that we get as well um do i want to move my large ship or my small move my small ship to get the coin i have the storage yes so i get another coin now I get a choice of four more building cards. What do we have? Cartographer's office. Whenever you remove a ruin, gain a step on your cartographer track. Pardon me. Surveyor's office. Whenever you erect a building, hmm, this this is sort of right up her alley. Draw a double landscape tile from the bag. Okay. Whenever you erect a building or build an income boat or a statue, its cost is reduced by one wood. I like this even better. Small shipyard, whenever you build an income boat, gain one step on your cartographer track. I'm going to grab the carpenter, so I'm going to get a one wood discount whenever I build something. I like that. Now I have the carpenter and the granary. Now, do I want to spend this action? I think I do, and I think I'm going to place it here. And now I have a choice of taking a normal worker or a special worker. If I take a normal worker, great. I'll have three normal workers to play with. But if I take a special worker, then if I have a normal worker in my on my player board that hasn't been placed yet, it's got to be removed immediately and moved to one of the Royal Order cards, which represent endgame scoring. So if I take a special worker... I'm not increasing the number of workers. All I've done is I've increased, uh, I, I've changed one of my normal workers into a special worker. If you decide to take this special worker, when you don't have a normal worker on your player board that's yet to be placed, then the special worker has to be moved immediately to uh, one of the Royal Order cards. So there's no way that you can ever take one of these special workers and not give up a worker in return. You could take a normal worker, you could take another normal worker later and have a total of four workers. I obviously want to demonstrate how special workers work, so I am going to have her take a special worker. So I'm going to click yes. Therefore, this normal worker has to go. It has to be placed on one of the available Royal Order cards. This one says at the end of the game, if you've built three buildings, you'll get three points. If you'll build four buildings you'll get five points if you build five buildings you'll get eight points that's probably the one i'm going to have alex choose because alex has been busy building buildings but let's just see these other ones how many incomes of boats have you built nothing yet how many statues have you built uh that's probably something that larry's going to want to take uh, make use of 
This one says, how many landscape spaces of any cultivation level make up your largest unbroken area of one landscape type? Well, neither one of us has been paying attention to that. So uh, I'm going to have Alex choose to take this normal worker and put it on this Royal Order card. So it just occupies that space. So at the end of the game, Alex gets to resolve this for end game scoring. She'll either get 0.3, well, she's already built two small buildings, so she's one building away, but still has to build that third building to get three points. If she builds four buildings, she'll get five instead. If she builds five buildings, she'll get eight points instead. That is an example of how you get a worker, and now Alex has got one normal worker and one special worker to her name. Let's end her turn, move over to Larry. So the statue crafting spot is now free. He's ready to remove another ruin, so he's going to place his normal worker here and remove a ruin to free up um, that. This is the only ruin he could have removed, so it gets flipped and moved into the statue crafting spot. Very simple turn for him. Back to uh, Alex. She's got nothing in the way of double landscape tiles, which is not going to be good when the income phase comes around, because if you don't have one, you don't place one. Let's have her come here and place her special worker uh, in this space that allows her to draw to or place to, and also advance one step on your cartographer track. Okay, obviously she's going to draw to, uh, because she can't place to. So she got two identical tiles, and now she'll advance one step on her cartographer track as the bonus. Remember, you don't get that bonus unless you're the first player to place a special worker there. Let's move over to Larry. Uh, he's pretty low on his cartographer track. Let's just do the simple thing and come here. Advance three steps. And uh, what do I want? Oh, I guess I want a food, don't I? <laughs> uh, yeah, Larry's got to worry about food. I'm not going to make that mistake again. So let's grab a food. Now that's not enough. I need to have two food right now to pay Larry to feed Larry's worker. So I've got to think about uh, where that other food's going to be coming from. I guess I'm going to be short. I'm, I'm busy teaching and I'm not thinking about meeting the needs of my workers. So Larry's going to have to take an anchor token as well. Okay, we're going to clean up. Uh, Alex has to pay two food to feed her workers. She had exactly two food, so the program took care of that. Larry is short one food. I got another anchor token. It had to go on the, on the ship that, it, that, that didn't have any anchor tokens on it. So now each one has one. And uh, I, I'm back to my situation where I get to clear one of those anchor tokens because I get a, a point for my, um, my statue. So again, it doesn't really matter. I'll, I'll clear this one. Which takes us into round three. So you can see what I mean about not necessarily doing particularly well, but at least you get to see how anchor tokens work. Let's have her remove a ruin. She's not necessarily interested in building statues, though she may, but it is important to get some of these ruins removed. Getting this one, I think, is a matter of time. You have to place it sooner or later. There are only five rounds. You have six islets, so you're not going to be placing one of those six. And possibly, if you box, your, box yourself in, you're not going to be placing two of those six. Take this tile. The only place you can put it is over here. It has to go here. Remember, it can't go here. You can't occupy both sides of a sandbank with an islet tile. So I have to rotate it so it goes this way. That's the only place that Alex can place this. So, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. I'll just remove that ruin for now. Let's remove this stone. Let's also remove this stone and put it into storage. Let's take this tile and let's position it 
this way so that one half of it so that the mountain side goes on the empty ruin hex in the center of the board and the settlement covers the mountain settlements are wild they can cover it and there's no resource there it's perfectly legal i will need to do a cartographer anytime action to insert a mountain shim to get this up to level two i've got the cartographer points that ends my income phase let's go over to larry let's take this one and place it like that so allow me to gain a food i'm at least halfway there i'll take the wood then for my double landscape placement i'll get rid of this stone put it into my storage which is now chock full I've got no room left in storage I'm gonna put the settlement in the empty space and I'll put the mountain on the mountain that's gonna require a cartographer action to insert a shim but now I'll have a level 2 settlement with cloth and a level 2 mountain with stone let's move into the action phase Now let's go ahead and build an income boat. So I could use the bonus and get a discount of two. I also have the carpenter, which might get me up to this space. I think it would. Okay, so I'm going to put my special worker here, which I'm going to, which allows me to build an income boat with a discount of two. And I think I can go here. What boat do I want to build? One gives you a coin. One gives you a cartographer advance. One gives you a choice of wood, stone, or cloth, and an extra storage spot. And this one gives you a choice of gold or cloth. This one gives you a double landscape tile. And this one lets you do any other income boat that's, on, that's already been built. Let's just build the, the double landscape tile boat. And I think I can put it here. So the uh, one wood is coming from this landscape three coins are coming from my storage and the other two are being made up by the discount and that gives me two points because this uh, you'll notice this one this landing space gives uh, these two give you one point these two give you two points this one gives you three points i didn't have quite enough to get up to that spot when you are scoring helm points for an action you must attribute all of those help points to one of your ships. You don't get to split it up. I can't move my small ship one space and my large ship one space. So I'm going to move the small ship two spaces. So it moves over this space, which allows... Oh, crap. Oh, I think I screwed that up, didn't I? She doesn't have a place to put a tile. Oh, man. Well, it's too late. I've messed up. These are the things you have to watch out for when you're playing the game. Uh, fortunately, when you're playing the game, you'll only have to be worrying about your stuff. So much for that. Let's go over to Larry's turn. Sorry, Alex. That's just the way it goes. Larry is going to he's going to go back to his regular space. He's going to build his second statue. He actually can build it either with wood or stone or wood or wood and or and gold. I think I'm going to save the save the gold and just go the stone route. So the three woods going to come from here, and the three stone. And I might as well just spend all the stone that's in my storage and free up those spots. And now I built my second statue. There was only one place it could have gone. I'm not even thinking about. I really should have been thinking about building a, a settlement to get that extra point. And Larry gets one point. I might as well just clear the other anchor. Not playing very well here. Okay, back to Alex. All right, you know what? Let's get rid of this stone and move it to storage. So I'm basically losing a stone in the process because I'm moving a two-stone resource into my storage, which is where it's going to turn into a one-stone resource. But I want to do that so I can show you the third type of cartographer anytime action. I've shown you one where you spend a, 
a, a cartographer point to insert a shim. I've shown you another a cartographer action where you place a, a landscape on an empty hex. Now I'm going to show you the third type where you place a single landscape on an existing landscape. In that case, you've got to spend three uh, cartographer points. The other cartographer action is when you place a single landscape tile on top of an existing landscape that's level four or higher. In that case, you have to spend four cartographer points. So let's um, take a cartographer anytime action. I'm going to put a, a, a hex here. I can make it either a settlement or a forest. I'm just going to put another forest on top of that and now make it a level two forest. That cost me three cartographer points. I'm down to one, level one on my cartographer track. I've got to build a statue. I'm going to have to pay a resource in order to do that. I'll pay the single cloth. And now, since the highest cultivation level in my peninsula is two, I'm going to go ahead and remove this two cloth from the top of the settlement and get it into my storage. So it comes, it gets converted into one cloth, but it's going to allow me to build a statue here and get an extra point, which we haven't demonstrated yet. So the two woods coming from here, the three stone is coming from here, and the statue is it's getting placed there, which now gets me a bonus point. So now I get to spend two a helm point. You're going to see what happens when you hit a bay tile. Because it's going to move from here to here and then from here to the bay. Uh, which, remember in the grand scheme of things, is over here. The small ship's going to move two spaces. It's going to go here and then to the bay. And when you reach the bay, you get a, a logbook. It gave me a just another double landscape tile. I kind of wish I would have gotten a better logbook, but those are drawn randomly just the way it is. In my example, I just kind of stick it in the corner. So it's in the corner of my player board on my left, but if we look at Alex, it's sitting up here in the bay tile in her upper right corner. Okay. Let's see. Larry doesn't have any landscape tiles. So he certainly won't be able to place one in his, in his next income phase unless I draw one now. So I guess I'm going to bring him up here to draw two landscape tiles. That way he's got stuff to choose from at the start of his next income phase. So I will draw two. Oh, but he does have this bonus from the two statues which I should have spent first. Does he have enough food? He doesn't have enough food again. But he does have cartographer points. But I guess I should I shouldn't mess around here. Let's um let's let's do an anytime action. Put a meadow here. Now I've got enough food. because <laughs> uh, if I had taken the special worker or even the normal worker I would have owed three food, and then I really would have been in a jam. So just as well that I guess I didn't take the worker right now. Um, it's end of the turn. Larry's got this cloth that, uh, that Alex paid him in his marketplace. So I guess I have the room. I'll move it into storage. Now we have to pay food. Alex, oh gosh, doesn't have any food. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, this is terrible. I'm, I'm sorry, folks. I'm just not concentrating. Larry had the two food he needed exactly. Alex gets to spend an, uh, uh, a point for her one statue. All she, she's not making much progress here. She's clearing an anchor. Not doing well at all. Larry gets two points for his two statues. I can move this way. Oh, I could have gone a drawn a, a landscape that way. I could have done something else with my normal worker. Or do I want to go this way and remove a ruin? Yeah, I think I want to go this way. So I'm going to move my large ship. Ugh, oh, it's terrible. Okay, we're in round four, and the score is pitiful. Okay, so for Alex to build a, an islet, she first has to build a double landscape and put it in here 
or in here, either one, it doesn't really matter, so that the eyelet has a place to be adjacent to something. Oh, she's getting another <laughs> a landscape tile. She's got a, those coming out. I'll collect that. That's part of the income fees as well. Let's build this a source of food, too. All right, I'm not going to worry about that for the time being. Let's build this here so that we can build an eyelet. I'm going to be placing the uh, this one here, and it's going to go this way, right like that. It's the only place I could place it. I suppose I could have rotated it that way. doesn't matter, though. So at least I've got one food, but I'm going to have to pay three foods. I think I'll have him place the uh, cartographer one as well. Like that. That's perfectly legal. That gets him part of the food he needs for the end of round four. You know, let's do this. Let's place this. Let's do a shim like that. Cost me one cartographer point. Gets me to level two settlement. And now I've got the food I need. So Larry's set for food. I know I don't, at least that's, oh, and he has to do his bonus. Oh, I almost forgot. Okay, so he's going to take another worker. I will take a special worker. The discount you get when you place a special worker. So I'm going to take a special worker, which means I have to give up one of my normal workers and place it on, I can't place it here. Obviously, I wouldn't anyway. I'm going to place it here. Since I'm clearly going to be building another statue, that's my goal at least. Okay, so I still only have two workers, but one special. So I've caught up to Alex at least, and that's at, that, at least as far as that goes. Now Alex has a severe shortage of resources. Let's place draw place two landscapes. So we're going to move a normal worker here, and I'm going to place two double landscape tiles and generate a horde of resources. I'm not really thinking this through, but I'm, I'm kind of going to just take a stab at it, and hopefully I won't. Hopefully I'll do do it well enough. I'm going to place a forest and a mountain here. I'll have to do a cartographer action, and that's going to be my cartographer action for this turn. I can't take another one. And yes, I'll place gold on top of that mountain. Uh, let's see if I remove, I'm going to remove this stone, stone settlement, rotate it this way and overlay it on these. Now this doesn't require a, any kind of a, um, a shim because I'm putting it on the level that these two are equal height. So it just over one tiles overlaying the other and that'll give me two stone. Okay. Hopefully I have enough to do what I plan to do. That's the end of Alex's turn. There's nothing else he can do. she can do. Okay, so now it's time for Larry for his worker. So I'm going to do a cartographer action and put something in one of these two spaces. So I'm adjacent to these ruins. And does it matter what I want? Uh, I might as well put a forest so I have more wood. So let's stick a forest there. Okay. So now we're going to do a special worker on this spot, which lets me both build and remove, but build a statue and remove a ruin. Obviously, I want to build first, free up the crafting spot, then remove. So let's build a statue. So I'm going to be paying two wood, the only two wood I've got. And two stone is going to come from this tile. Oh, not, not two stone, sorry. Two gold is coming. Oh, I'm overpaying. Oh, well, I'm overpaying. I'm paying three gold when I only owe two gold. So be it. So let's move my small ship and get the benefit of all these tiles here. So I'll gain a food. 
and uh, let's get a wood. And it drew me, I got to draw another double landscape tile, and now I get to remove a ruin. This is the only one I can remove. Goes from there to there into the statue crafting spot. Now, let's see if I didn't screw up Alex's turn. What can she do? Well, let's just go for, this is what I'm planning to do. Question is, do I have enough to build a, a, uh, a fortress, or is it going to be a large building? I can build a fortress. Did I even have the option of building a large building? I don't have four stone. I'm short a stone. I'm short two coins. I, I couldn't even afford a large building if I wanted to. I'm paying three stone, which I have. One stone from storage, two stone from here. I'm paying three cloth, two from here, one from here. I'm paying three gold from here. I am paying what's left, uh, the wood. Uh, let's see, I'm discounting two, so I only owe three wood, so I pay the three wood from here. And I don't, it would have been nice to have a settlement. And I don't have the any time, I don't have the cartographer points to do it. Uh, all I needed was one more cartographer point. I could have just made it five points instead of four, but oh well. Uh, it has to go on one of these spaces. I will cover the mountain. So I get four points. I cannot worry about this anchor and just move my small ship. Let's see where it's going to go if I do that. Uh, let's go over to Larry's board here for a second. Small ship's going to come around this way. Oh, I don't have... He's going to go one, two, three, four, not pass by any islets. If I move my large ship... But I want to demonstrate what happens when a ship reaches another player's harbor. So I am going to go ahead and move the small ship four spaces. One, two, three, four. You can see that multiple ships can occupy the same part of a sandbank. That's perfectly valid. Okay, so now my small ship, Alex's small ship, is sitting over here next to Larry's Harbor. And Alex will be able to score at least one more point at the end of this round for this uh, ruin, uh, for that statue that she's built. I still haven't supplied a cargo ship. Cost six cloth and two gold. He doesn't have any gold, and he's short of cloth. And he doesn't have any cartographer points either. Three steps, and let's take a gold. Yeah, well, let's just end the turn there for now. <laughs> oh, God. Alex took an anchor, so now she's got um, one on each ship. Oh, Larry's the only one who's got the food. Uh, he's got two here. I've got one over here. Alex gets a point for, uh, but all she can do is clear her anchor. She's going to clear the one off the large ship. Oh, this is so sad. I get three points. Um, I have the room in my storage, so let's move my small ship. I got a cartographer point there. I got a bay tile that gives me a coin and a cloth. Yes, on both. Oh, I'm sorry, a not a cloth, a food. Coin of food. Well, I suppose that's good. Round five, income phase. Oh, man, I've been so messing up here. 
but at least you got to see an example of a fortress. I would have liked it to be a fortress on a settlement, but I didn't think it through well enough. Now I got to make sure that uh, somebody can at least supply a cargo ship because that's the only action I haven't demonstrated yet. And it's probably going to be Larry because he's got a head start. So uh, what do I want Alex to do? It would be nice if she could build that fourth building. Um, well, if she's going to have any chance of doing that, she's going to have to place this. And we're going to place it here. And we're going to need a shim. She's got one cartographer point left to her name. And this way she'll have the food she needs for next round. So at least she won't screw that up. Uh, do I want gold or do I want stone? Um, for a large building, we want stone. No. Oh. <sighs> I've screwed up again. Yeah, I can't place an islet. There's no place I can place it so that it's adjacent to my landscape. So I really have messed up. So she's not getting to place her last islet. Oh, but I do have this income boat. But I don't get to place an islet. So you get to see what happens when you don't when you don't think straight. Okay, uh, and now Larry's income phase. Uh, I guess I could just take the easy way out and place this. He's got cartographer points. And I need gold. That does not get me the gold. So that's not where I want to place. I need to place... Oh, I could place it here. Oh, shoot, but I can't. I don't have the storage, so I can't clear these spots. Oh, I've really boxed myself in, too. Um, my storage is full. And do I need food? How am I on food? I'm short on food. So let's take this tile and put it right here. I will need a shim, so I'm going to have to do a cartographer action. But it'll give me the wood I need. Great. Okay, and now I'm placing an eyelet. Uh, oh, as a bonus, I can get gold or cloth or coin. I certainly don't need coin. I, actually, I don't have the room. I'm not. I don't have a place to put it. So I'm placing the eyelet, but I'm not getting to take advantage of the eyelet. Um. I'll just put it there. And I'll take gold. Okay. Last two turns of the game. So what if I had her draw and place and hope that she draws? Let's let's do that. Draw and place with the normal worker. So I will draw first and place second this one, which can go here. Do I want gold? No, I guess I want stone. Okay. So we're she's ready to build a large building. Let's go over to Larry. It's his job to supply a cargo ship. What I can do is demonstrate... Oh, yes. Okay. So, I want to demonstrate a supply ship action. To do that, I need gold. There's no way I can generate gold right now because I can't, even if I could place a, a, did a cartographer action, I can't free up, a, I can't take all my spaces where I can generate gold, well, my one space here where I can potentially generate gold, I can't get this stone off because my storage is full. But what I can do is show you uh, another action, an anytime market trade action. Anytime during the game, 
You can perform a market trade anytime action. You could trade two cloth for a coin. You could trade two gold for a resource, not a coin. Or you can exchange any four for anything of something else. That's what I'm going to do. I am going to spend this wood and this coin and this food. I'm just freeing up storage. And this wood. And now I can ex exchange four for one. And what I need is a gold. So let's exchange four for one and take a gold. Now I've, and that goes into my marketplace, but I've now got room to put it into my storage. If I'm going to supply the best cargo ship I can. Let's see. I can't go over here, so I don't get any discount. So this one costs four and two. I've got five and two. This costs five gold. I'm nowhere near that. This costs six cloth and two gold. I could potentially do that. I just need another cloth. So I will do another market trade at any time action. And I will spend three wood and one stone and exchange that for cloth, right? Six and two, yeah. Exchange for a cloth. Okay, all of that to demonstrate that you could do any time market trade actions during the game and trade car and trade once again trade cloth for coins at two to one, trade gold for resources at two to one, or exchange anything for anything else at a at four to one. Okay, we're doing a cargo ship. And I might as well do the special worker that allows me to place a double landscape tile, which then could generate the resources I need to build the statue on my next turn. So we're going to do that. So I'm going to go put my special worker there. Let us place a double let's place a double landscape tile. So I need a source of wood and stone right here so I'm going to get this wood off the board no that stone off the board when I'm generating the stone and cloth I might as well put it here and put this side of it here and this way I can get gold and cloth I'm not getting a source of wood though so I guess I'm not building that statue but if I get enough gold and cloth I could potentially supply into the cargo ship so let's take the gold and the cloth now we now I've got seven cloth and five gold we can certainly do this one uh, six cloth three here and two here might as well free up the storage Two gold right from storage. Oh, I need another cloth. Oh, did I just screw up? I did, didn't I? Now I'm going to waste a cloth. So, so be it. Okay, so I got a crate. When you supply a cargo ship, you get a crate. The crate can then be spent on one of these five bonuses, which are not going to be a surprise. Draw a double landscape. Place a double landscape, advance two steps on a cartographer, get two coins, or get two resources. That might be useful. I've got a cloth here in, in my marketplace. Maybe I could supply another cargo ship. I've got one cloth. I've got the three gold. Yeah, I'll put the crate here, and I'll take two gold. I'm, changing, I'm trading the crate bonus for two resources of my choice, not coin. Uh, so I'm going to, should I just take, oh, I need another cloth, don't I? Yeah. What was this cargo ship again? 
three gold, two cloth. I've got three gold. I need a cloth. Actually, I should have taken cloth instead of gold. Uh, but that's fine. Whatever. Now I've got two cloth and four gold. Okay. So for this cargo ship, I'm getting two points. Remember, it's this one. The crate lid gets removed from the cargo ship. It was here. Now it's been removed. It's been placed down here. I used it already to get the bonus. And now I get two helm points. And... Um, If I, go, if I move this guy, I'm going to be getting a cartographer point, which I desperately need. And if I go this way, I'm getting cloth or gold, which would not be bad either. That would give me, expand my options. I could take a cloth. I could take a gold, which would allow me to supply this cargo ship. I might as well do that. So let's move my large ship. And I'll take, I just forgot what I, uh, shoot, I just took cloth by accident. Is that what I wanted? No, I wanted gold. <laughs> I just hit the wrong key. Oh, man. Uh, I'm going to cheat. And change one of this cloth into a gold. <laughs> what you can do when you're... Okay, because I I just hit the wrong key. I meant to take a gold. So now I have five gold and two cloth. So I can supply another cargo ship next turn. And I can supply this one. And get another two points out of it. I'll just end my turn. Okay, Alex. Uh, what the heck was I doing here? I was trying to accumulate everything I needed to build a large building. And I think I've got it. So I... Placing my special worker here to get a discount. I've got what I need. I've got uh, four wood. I only need three wood, but I have no. I'm overpaying, so I'm paying the four wood. I'm paying the four stone, and I'm taking the two discount on the coin. Where am I putting this? It's got to go on a level four which means it's going here or here. I don't think it really matters at this point. It's my last turn, so I'll put it there. Oh, I wanted to demonstrate what happens when you get to a harbor. So I'm going to, if I clear the anchor, all I need is one point. Yeah, I'll clear the anchor and then use my small ship, which goes over that space, which helps me remove a ruin, this one. I could remove actually this one or this one. doesn't matter. And I could put it here and get another helm point. You get a helm point if you fill that statue crafting spot. That gets me a helm point. I haven't fully resolved my other one yet. Uh, is my program going to get confused by this? I sure hope not. Let's see what happens. Because I should get a logbook. Okay, yep, my program is fine. It got me a logbook, which got, advanced my cartographer. Now I have to pay a harbor fee because I entered Larry's Harbor earlier. Uh, so uh, I should have done that first, technically. I have to give him a resource. It doesn't matter. I'll give him a, a, a stone. Now I get a building card, which I get to use one time. Ooh, gain it for three steps on your cartographer track is nice. Remember, these are nice one-time benefits. Move a building or a statue from one of your landscape spaces to a free one. Yeah, I'm, that's not a good value. Scrapyard. Flip one of the income boats in your landing face space down, which will get me a helm point. And large shipyard. Perform the action. Build one income boat. Uh, so this... Advanced three spaces doesn't really get me, though I could use it twice, once this turn, and I'll be able to reactivate it during cleanup and use it again, which will essentially get me to the top of the cartographer track 
which gets me another helm point because I know that I can trade those cartographer points in at a five to one, which I haven't explained end game scoring yet. So frankly, I can spend it here to get a helm point or spend it here. I might as well spend it here. So now I'll use the library, take three help to get three cartographer points, but I'm going to be able to use it again in a second. You'll see why. I'm ending my turn. Back to Larry. What did I want to do? Try to do another supply, a cargo ship. So I'm going to put my normal worker on this side this time. Remember, I wouldn't have been able to use that same action space. I can go here and supply this one for two helm points. I've got to supply five gold. There's three gold. There's two more. And two cloth right here. Two hump points coming my way. Oh, and I've supplied two cargo ships, which gets me another bonus, which I might as well use to just get two more points because I don't need another. Well, I could take a normal worker and just get another turn, but I don't have resources, so I think I'll just take the two points. First, let me spend these two points. Now, let's do Larry's bonus. I'm going to move this milestone here to get two helm points. I might as well move that one, because if I move my small ship, it's not passing over anything. Might as well move my large ship and get a logbook and hope I get something decent. I'll get some resources. Resources you can trade in five to one, two at end game. I'm kind of giving you a hint of what happens at end game. I got a lousy coin. The good logbooks give you two two of something. Fortunately, I got stuck with just a coin. So let's just end the turn. Alex needs two food. She's overpaying with three. <laughs> Ironic. Larry needs to pay three food. I've got four, so I just pay the three food right from here. Now we can reactivate building cards and or crate lids. You either pay two coins to reactivate a large building card, or you pay one coin to reactivate a, um, a crate lid. However, if you've built your fortress, as Alex has, you can do both of those and not pay any coins at all. Now, she never did supply a cargo ship, so she can't reactivate a crate lid, but she can reactivate her library for free and then use it again. So she's reactivating her library, basically flipping it over. If you're playing the game, if you've used it, you flipped it face down, you reactivate it by flipping it face up. Larry can pay one coin to reactivate a crate lid. Unfortunately, he has a coin, so he's going to reactivate this crate lid for a coin. Now we're back to Alex. She gets a helm point for building one statue. But first, we're going to use her library to max out her cartographer at six, because that will contribute to endgame scoring. Uh, I think her best bet is to move her small ship. I'm pretty sure about that. Yep, because it's going to pass over those tiles, and she's going to get a food and a resource, and we're getting as much into storage as possible. Now it's Larry's turn. He gets three helm points for three statues. We also want to use these crate lids to for as many points as we can. Bumping up uh, two steps on your cartographer track is good, so we'll use one crate lid for that. I think I'm just going to use this to draw a double landscape tile because the storage is going to be filled. So I've reused both my crate lids. Now I'm going to move the small ship, which is going to come this way. I'm going to get a food, a stone or a wood. I'll take the food. I'll take the wood. It doesn't matter. Now you first draw the logbook and then you pay a harbor fee. Unfortunately for Larry, he's only got one storage spot, and he can't free up one by paying the harbor fee first. So he's only going to get either a food or a wood, not both. Doesn't matter which one he takes. 
Uh, now he has to pay the harbor fee. So let me explain how endgame scoring works. You first count up your helm points. Now my program does that for me. But when you're playing the game, you add up your helm points simply by taking all the logbooks you've collected, multiplying those by five, because remember, you didn't get a logbook until you traversed five spaces. So each logbook is equivalent to five helm points. And then, depending upon where your ships are, you figure out what extra helm points you got for a ship movement. My program handles that for me. So Larry started off with 16 helm points. He had built three statues. Remember his Royal Order card. Three statues gets him three points. He has leftovers. He had 12 things left over. Combination of cartographer points, resources and storage, as well as double landscape tiles. He had a total of 12. Divide by 5. That's two more points. He got to 21. Alex, on the other hand, 13 helm points. However, she did build four buildings, which is worth five points right here. So she got five points for her Royal Order card, had 11 leftovers worth two points for a total of 20. So all things considered, pretty close. Hopefully uh, you followed this. I did end up covering all the rules like I intended to, maybe not so gracefully or elegantly, but hey, you know, trying to teach, trying to figure out what you want to do for two players with this heavy game, um, not easy. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Hope you enjoyed this. Bye-bye for now.